You may have heard the lyrics, what a long strange trip it's been from the Grateful Dead song Truckin'. It has certainly been a long strange trip for the Deadheads old and new alike who have followed the band's members for almost 60 years. The Grateful Dead are the original jam band, a rock, country, and psychedelic infused improvised anomaly. In San Francisco 1965, a group of musicians from varying backgrounds decided to rename their band the Grateful Dead after a game of dictionary led them to the word. Jerry Garcia, who lost half of his middle finger in a woodcutting accident as a child, partnered with Bob Weir, Bill Kreutzmann, Phil Lesh, and Ron Pickpen McKernan to create a psychedelic rock ensemble. Ken Kesey, author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, fostered a breeding ground for counterculture with his LSD-fueled half-concert, half-art experience acid tests. It was here that the dead would flourish, using long sets, improvised electric guitar, drum solos, and an unrivaled atmosphere. They rarely played the same song two nights in a row, and prided themselves on playing a different set list each night. This uniqueness was unlike most bands, who play predetermined set lists off recent albums, as well as hit songs. You would probably expect to hear Hotel California at an Eagles concert. They released their first studio album in 1967, and would release 12 more until Jerry Garcia's unfortunate death in 1995. Between their creation and disbandment, the band obtained a massive following of fans. Even though they did not have a Billboard number one hit, the fans would order tickets months in advance and camp out at their shows while partying in the parking lot. Bill Graham, their promoter, worked hard to spread the dead's image around San Francisco. Many looked to Jerry Garcia as some sort of deity, holding a legendary stage presence His guitar playing was also exceptional. Throughout the years and as they gained fame, the numbers of deadheads steadily increased. As a result of this, the Grateful Dead market also grew. Band posters, tie-dyed clothes, and veggie burritos are some of the items that make up the market known as the lot. But the role the brand plays in the economy is also significant. For example, the brand impacted the cities that they traveled to in over 2,300 concerts at 600 plus venues. They were international. Hosting concerts in Europe, Egypt, and even China was planned until the Tiananmen Square massacre compelled them to cancel. After Jerry Garcia died, the remaining band members took a hiatus only to return in 2003 as the dead. Since their return, the brand has been successful as ever. They hold their place as the kings of the hippie market through merchandise, licensing, as well as concert tickets. Let's investigate the Grateful Dead's marketing strategies, visual identity, message, consumer perception, and how they've changed. Also, we'll touch on how the competition has performed in comparison. In the mid-1960s, the band was defined by their psychedelic and sometimes ambient but powerful sound. Their strategy concentrated on making their own unique sound, regardless of what other bands were doing. Not interested in making a mainstream rock and roll hit, they frequently played in parks, small venues, and festivals. Rather than potentially getting scammed by the record label like Little Richard, the band instead created their own record label and focused on performing live concerts using state-of-the-art music technology, such as the Owsley Stanley's Wall of Sound. A musical experience filled with improvisation and inspired by psychedelics was the product the Grateful Dead began offering. College students, artists, normal people, and degenerates could be found at a Grateful Dead show during the Summer of Love. These free-spirited hippies could also be found at Jimi Hendrix, Jefferson Airplane, and Janis Joplin concerts. The lyrics of Anthem of the Sun and Oxamoxa told biblical stories and were sometimes abstract like, look for a while at the China cat sunflower proud walking jingle in the midnight sun. This went along with the Dead's themes of psychedelics. By 1980, the Dead sold out Halloween at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. They had released 16 albums by then, including four live compilations. You can follow the evolving and ever-adapting music of the Grateful Dead from 1965 to 1980 by listening to a song from each album. From the early years to 1980, you would observe a jarring change as the band members themselves changed, but also new instruments were added. Also, in 1980, 
Brent Midland joined the band and added his unique sound. The Grateful Dead loved adding new musical elements to add to their drawn-out jams, in contrast to pop music of the time, which tended to conform to the culture. The album covers paint a picture of the transformation the band went through each year with their brilliant artwork. It seems they made covers that had pleasing aesthetics, unlike some other artists of the era. The culture of deadheads is truly a phenomenon, and many documentaries and news articles capture their essence. In 1980, Jerry Garcia saw that there were many teenage children in the audience. He was happy that the fan base was increasing in size. Also observing, there was a group of hardcore dead fanatics who followed the band on tour. Garcia understood his network of deadheads. They related it to the common experience of seeing a Grateful Dead concert. Jerry says, well, it's obviously very important to them. And more than that, it's giving them an adventure. They have stories to tell. Like, remember that time we had to go all the way to Colorado and we had to hitchhike the last 400 miles because the VW broke down in Kansas? Or something like that. That's given them a whole common group of experiences which they can talk about. For a lot of people, going to Grateful Dead concerts is like bumping into a bunch of old friends. There's a vast network of deadheads. They're kind of like people who have come to know and recognize each other, and it's like support. Sometimes a person can find a ride across the country with a deadhead, or stay over at somebody's house, or any of that. So that seems to function pretty well for them. The Grateful Dead Concert Experience This is the purple cow that the Grateful Dead offered. The band had shifted from their psychedelic theme of the 1960s into a more structured and diverse experience, but kept their long show times and improvisational techniques. This kept the Deadheads coming back, building a cult-like family in the process. Thanks to Jerry Garcia's outstanding guitar playing ability and Robert Hunter's Americana-infused lyrics, their music was also distinctive. They aren't the best at what they do. They are the only ones that do what they do. News of the next tour or a potential collaboration was highly anticipated and spread through word of mouth. Mixing genres, they would experiment with their albums, but touring was the true business model. At the concerts, the Dead would allow live taping of their shows at no cost to the fans. These cassette tapes would then be distributed amongst the network of Deadheads. Creating a hobbyist group, the tapers would often argue about which concert was their favorite, trade, and reproduce tapes as much as they liked. Although they released official recordings as well, this was a brilliant move on behalf of the dead because it was free advertising, and the word of mouth is powerful. They hired a fan, Scott Brown, to manage their community, but the band did lose control of the marketing message. In 1987, they released a music video on MTV for Touch of Grey. This was a stark contrast to the rebellious free spirits they represented at Haith Ashbury in the 1960s, the dead commercialized. Their target market was the concert goers who would attend seeking the experience the band was known for and the live concert experience was represented in the music video. The Grateful Dead depicted Minutemen, Uncle Sam, and other famous American symbols in their artwork because they were inherently liberal. They believed in freedom and fear of power and demonstrated this through lyrics while performing at charity events like Live Aid. The dead were no strangers to environmentalism and war either. The song We Can Run includes the lyrics, I'm dumping my trash in your backyard, making certain you don't notice really isn't so hard. You're so busy with your guns and all of your excuses to use them. The message of the Grateful Dead, representing psychedelia, dancing, liberalism, and America proved successful. Garcia's death shocked the nation, but the deadhead did not go into hiding. When the Wave That Flag reunion tour was announced in 2004, many shows sold out. In 2015, old and new generations of deadheads came together at Soldier Field in Chicago for Fairly Well, which was the 50th anniversary of the band. Billboard estimated the tour to earn over $55 million. Their most recent tour with John Mayer saw nearly $115 million profit. How does the Grateful Dead continue to profit so massively with over 1 billion in ticket sales. Ticket sales are significant, but it also helps that they have signature tie-dyed t-shirts, posters, and other accessories to buy at merchandise stands during the concert. These products tend to have colorful and positive imagery. 
The ticket overhead was less than many bands due to their proprietary ticketing service, GDTS, but unfortunately, the band has partnered with Ticketmaster in more recent years as most artists already do. While selling licensed products, the debt continued to allow unlicensed products to be sold by fans. In the parking lot of a Grateful Dead show, you will likely find what would normally be a counterfeit band t-shirt sold by many. By allowing unlicensed merchandise to be sold, the Dead ends up getting free advertisement. Fans invent unique designs that the Dead may not consider doing. The lot that this merchandise is sold helps add to the Grateful Dead experience. Many fans will not even buy a ticket to the show, but could still have a good time by buying from one of the various unofficial vendors or from a food stand. Drum circles, dreadlocks, and painted vans are a common sight. Tie-dyed is a real depiction of Deadlot and its inhabitants. Weird is the new cool, says Seth Godin. The dead know how to communicate with fans. Their 1971 Skull and Roses album included a sign-up sheet for a mailing list that said Dead Freaks Unite. Growing their community through social media, they released albums to promote tours, rather than play shows to promote record sales like most musical acts. Maybe artists today can learn from this as streaming services like Spotify diminish musicians' profits. In 2009, they released an iPhone app. Also, they've released several billboards promoting tours, have an active web form called dead.net, and were some of the first to use email. The visual identity of the dead has not changed significantly over the years. The Steal Your Face logo, dancing bears and dancing skeleton visuals have remained at the core of their designs. Many artists gladly collaborate with the dead through brand x brand partnerships, some larger than others. These partners include Stanley Mouse, Igloo, Nike, and Peloton. Grateful Dead is seen on high fashion runways, in urban outfitters, and even Walmart. Some unintended market influencers spotted wearing dead merchandise include Seth Rogen and Victoria Beckham. Also, many baseball teams have a Grateful Dead night where their music is played and branded products are distributed. Meet Up at the Movies features a yearly viewing of a vintage Grateful Dead performance, recreating the experience at a movie theater. The Dead are on a more commercial scale now, and the diversity of the brand knows no bounds. As a result of this diversification to obtain profits, the Dead is looked to as a diverse, accepting, and innovative platform for businesses and artists. Check out this Grateful Dead lettuce and other interesting collaborations. The audience has certainly grown larger thanks to their unique marketing strategies. They improvise not only in their music, but also in how they advertise and communicate it with fans. It seems the Deadheads are still loyal fans of the music, even though Garcia is gone. Now he is an angel-like figure to many who attend the concerts to relive the summer of love feeling. Or maybe they are just there for the music and parking lot experience. After all, there is nothing like a Grateful Dead concert.